Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He's worthy of praise. Amen. Glory to God. Uh, like I was just saying, oh, how he loves his soul. And he wants to declare, oh, how they love me the same way. Amen. This is what God is after in his people. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Well, let's turn. We didn't get to share on, uh, we didn't get to gather together the other night. Uh, Snow and more snow and more snow and hopefully the end of snow. I don't know. I uh, it's winter still. Technically, it is still winter. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we've had a pretty mild winter so far, and um, looks like it's going to be pretty warm this week. So whatever snow we have probably will pretty much disappear. So I'm glad for that. Amen. So we didn't get to share on Wednesday uh, in uh, our our study here, the book of Ruth. I, I kind of am looking forward to this verse. Uh, I was looking at it, and I've been looking at it. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, there's, there's a lot here. It, it kind of seems like a strange thing, so to speak, when you read the verse on the surface. But as you begin to look at it, and, uh, you know, I always had this question, and I'm not going to say it, you know, and, and if, I don't think I'll talk about it today, but I might, I don't know. Uh, I've always had this question, and I'm not saying I, got, I have it right down to, you know, you know, all the understanding of it, but all of a sudden now, you know, you, you know how sometimes when you read, and it's like... Uh, Especially when you read in the Gospels, when Jesus or somebody, they said something and it was like, okay, what in the world is like out of the clear blue? What in the world is he talking about, right? But then, you know, we, you know, we have to know there's a reason, right? There is, there's not just some idle statement for no reason at all. It has to fit in somewhere and, and everything. And um, I, I have one of those concerning this verse, you know, and... Um, Maybe we'll get to it today. It depends how far I get. Uh, this, this is a pretty big verse, and I could, and I probably uh, may spread it over today and Wednesday and uh, go from there. How's that? Glory to God. So if you turn with me to Ruth chapter 4, important, important, important chapter, right? Ruth chapter 4. Uh, verse 7. It's hard to believe, but we're, we're really winding down. I know I, I keep saying that, but it's like, <laughs> it, you know, I keep asking the Lord, Lord, what, what, where, where do we go from here? What do you want to show us here and after this? And uh, the one thing that I do like, um, I really feel this way, that every time God gives us a teaching, if I can call it that, uh, better understanding, uh, deeper, greater, whatever you want to, you know, you have to be careful what you use so somebody doesn't pick it apart from what you're trying to really say. I like to look at it like this, you know, if I put bricks on the front of my house or on my house, it's just another brick that's going to make the whole thing come together of what God's, well, do I need knowledge? Yes, but will knowledge by itself? No, like we need him, right? You can do nothing unless you're connected to him, right? It doesn't matter how much you know. That's why we have a lot of church folks that are running around. You know, they'll, they'll hear the name it and claim it and they'll blab it and grab it and declare, but, you know, they'll do it, you know, from a Simba point of view. You'll get that, right? Everybody gets that? I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. So... Yes, we're kings and priests, but he wants us to come to perfection, to maturity. And I like this, this verse here because this verse has a lot to do with the principles of perfection or maturity. Okay? Um, completion. So let's read the verse. Let's break it down. I hope you all, all have your student hats on. And, and you know what your student hat is, right? It's the mind of Christ. Anyway, <laughs> put it on, right? Isn't that what it says? Put on the mind of Christ. Wait, I thought he already gave it to me. Yeah, you know. 
I mean, but put it on. We have to put it on. We have to exercise it in our lives. Amen? Okay, verse 7. Here we go. Now, do you remember verse 6? Wait, let's, 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 uh, let's just take a quick look at it uh, because I'm reading off my notes. I have to. Um, do you remember this? Just a little, little, little bit of review. Uh, Boaz said, hey, buy the land from Naomi. And he, yeah, I'll take it. Right? Remember that? How many times? Yeah, I want it. But then we find out the rest of the story, right? <laughs> oh, wait, the minute you do it, you have to also buy Ruth. Oh, wait, I can't do that, right? And we did talk about that as the law, right? We did. I think it's a good application. Um, and the reason I think it's a good application is because it really is talking about Adam's flesh, isn't it? There is really nothing wrong with the law. I wish a lot of people would get that straight and just, you know, don't, don't extract. You know, we, we've been redeemed. You know, we're not under the law anymore. You're right. We are not under the weakness of it through flesh, right? But God still, like, like you know, I, I, for clarity, right? God's love is unconditional. Well, it kind of is conditional, isn't it? The difference between conditional man's love and conditional God's love is this. Watch. Conditional man's love is self-centered. Conditional God's love is Christ-centered. All he's trying to get you to do is line up to the pattern, right? And this is why he says, if you love me, you'll do what? Keep my commands. So he puts a condition on us, right? And the first one is, oh, love him with everything. And love one another with everything, right? And therefore, oh, hallelujah, we have a family. How cool is that? Pretty simple, right? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I get to live. But it's no longer my self-centeredness or the weakness of my flesh that lives, but it is what? Christ. By faith. Through the Son, the Spirit of the Son, which He put into our hearts. Right? We're able to accomplish this. And you know what one of the greatest revelations you will ever have as a Christian? Everybody say this with me. It won't happen. Wait, let me rephrase back up. Don't say that part. Not everything will happen immediately, overnight. It just doesn't. In God's economy, he has immediately's and he has time. And the reason I say it like this, watch. I know I'm on a little tangent here, but I think clarity's needed. Watch this, watch. God isn't governed by time, but he works in time, or he works with time, or time works with him. I don't care how you want to say it. But every once in a while, he has to do things Immediately, right? Immediately. How do you know that? Hey, wait, it didn't take a man to make a baby. Right? It didn't take planting a seed to grow a crop or have food the next day. There's so many illustrations like this in the Bible, right? Wait, that can't happen. A withered hand became a hand, right? Okay, so you get that, right? So he now says he can't redeem it because he's heard the whole story, right? So verse 7, here we go. Now was, or, or not was, uh, now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and changing. All right? For to confirm all things, I like that too, don't you? To confirm all things, all right? A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in. Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but geez, 
I, I've read that before, and I really never understood it all. And, uh, you know, there, there's a whole lot here. Like I say, it answers some questions um, of things that I've read, you know, and things like that uh, in times past or whatever. And th- this is why I love God's Word, right? You know, you want a word from God? Read His Word. Everybody's looking for a prophet. The prophet is Jesus. And he wrote everything down. Now watch this. Here's the first. You want a little bit of proof? Watch. Let's read the beginning. Now this was the manner in what? Former time. So they once had a tradition, right? That's what manner is. Or, right, is that not right? They had a tradition that they plucked their shoe off. But look, obviously the book of Ruth was written sometime later. Because it almost appears that they are no longer following this tradition any longer. Because this was the way they did it in former times. Kind of sounds like church today. We forget. Right? But former times. So obviously the book of Ruth was written later, right? Are you following me? Okay, here we go. Now this was the manner in former times. So it, it, it appears to me that the custom that they went by or the tradition no longer existed. And I, I believe that because the writer had to point that out, that they didn't just say, what in the world was he plucking his shoe off for? Because look, can you imagine plucking your shoe off for anything like this? Think about what he was doing. He was, right, given the opportunity to redeem the land and, not Naomi, but Ruth, right? And the guarantee of that was the giving of a shoe. Doesn't even make sense, does it? Oh, wait, it does. It really does. Okay. It, it really does. And so anyway, the writer had to point out, look, this custom doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist in our society, right? Like you go buy a house, what do you do? You have to get lawyers. Well, some people do. You go get lawyers. You have to go get legal people. How's that? Sign all the documents, right? Are you with me? So we don't go by those customs, but all they did was they plucked off their shoe. Can you imagine going into someone, oh, my, well, here's my shoe. You, you, you know. So on the surface, when I read this verse, it's like, wow, they did some weird things in the old days, right? And, and you have to understand that God never put anything in his Bible, in, his, in, in the book. He never had anything. Like, I always think about this, right? Like when... Whoever wrote the first five books, I I guess we can attribute it to Moses, right? Like, Moses wasn't there when Adam was created. So Moses had to sit down with someone. Now, and a lot of people say, well, this is why, you know, somebody just made up the story, right? Made up the Bible, made all that. Well, I'll tell you what, whoever made it up did a really good job of being able to show all the illustrations all the woven words that make up the same purpose through the whole book. Watch. Jesus shows up. He's walking on the road with a couple of guys. And he says what? He preached from when? He declared who he was from Moses to that moment through the prophets. Why is that? Because God wrote everything down. And it was written down after the fact. Like, how do you know all the little details? Oh, it, uh, oh wait, God had to sit down with somebody, didn't he? W- watch this. Remember what? Where was Paul for like 14 years? It says he was on the backside of the desert, and he what? He consulted with nobody. And we get a message, and we think we're somebody, right? No, no. 
God put all this down so that you and I could dig, we could search, we could find. What does he say? Seek it, right? Like you would go in after, you know, like a million dollars, right? Multi-million dollars. Which then he turns around and says, look, my wisdom is better than money. Right? Okay, so does it make sense to pluck a shoe off? No, but let's find out why would God even mention the tradition that took place, okay? All right, are you good with it? All right. So we also have to understand, um, okay, so we have to understand, right, that the the, the tradition, the custom was obsolete, all right? And, um, And we have to also understand why is this event, why is this situation, this ceremony taking place at all, right, like this, where it was, where, where did it take place? At the gate, and we already went through this, I still think it's pretty cool, the gate is the center of life, right? Everything revolves around, if we went to the book of Revelation, around the what? The throne, right? And the throne is just a picture, it's not this seat that somebody's sitting on, the picture is really the life of Christ and all of its power and authority. Church church folks have been tainted for too long when they hear the word power because all they think about is, you know, but real authority or real power. I told you, Jesus had more power to stay on the cross than to get off of it. This is why when Peter said to Ananias in Acts chapter 5, he said, you had the power within you to overcome the flesh, to make the right decision, watch this, and actually demonstrate it or execute it. You ever do this before? You know what the right decision is and you still go the opposite direction? Or not? not well, I know, I know what's right, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. No, no, knowing what's right and then demonstrating it. This is what God, right? This is, a, this is all about the behavior. This is all about the lifestyle. This is, and then all of a sudden, you know what that really is called? Praise. Because it came from an inner decision of worship that really said, God, I love you with my whole heart. And we never really get this Right? We never really get this, that all these little things in life are just opportunity. We used to call them tests in Christianity, right? But I'm going to rename it. They're opportunities to express who he is through our lives. They're opportunities. And we can't condemn ourselves when we do fail, but we have to understand you can't live a path, a lifestyle. Like, you're going to make mistakes, right? But there's a difference between making a mistake and living a lifestyle. Okay, all right. So, the ceremony, right, the ceremony or the event um, is, a, is, is, a, um, is, is evidence, right? It's... It's going to be the proof, right, of the promise that was made or an act that is performed, okay? So they're about to perform something here at the gate, all right? So, uh, hallelujah. Are you, are you good? Everybody good. So redeeming is linked with change. That's why I like this. It said concerning, redeeming, uh, or wait, yeah, concerning, redeeming, and concerning change, all right? Redeeming and change. So, um, hang on one second. Had to make it a little big for some reason. I couldn't see it as well today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so the word changing uh, is the word, it means barter. Now, everybody knows what barter is? What's it mean to barter? Barter. It means to exchange goods or services for other goods or services without using 
money, right? Barter. So this word change, it actually means barter. But it also means compensation or exchange, recompense, restitution. We understand restitution, right? It also means to alter. It means to barter, dispose of, remove. So what we're trying to get an understanding here is something, everybody say this with me, something's about to change. Right? Isn't that really what Christianity is all about? Change. Isn't that what redemption really is all about? Change. We cannot ever believe or think that we can come to Christ and not ever change. You have to change right from the get-go. How do you know that? The first thing in the path of walking his life is to do what? Repent. Which means to do what? Turn. In other words, I have to change my direction. Does anybody know what direction I'm changing from? Adam to Christ. Death to life. Darkness to light. Take your pick, whatever you want to say. There has to be a change. A change. We don't like this, but listen, this is why at one time Pentecostal people were really known by the way, you know, you could tell they didn't look like the world, they didn't act like the world and, uh, uh, in a lot of ways, right, and all these kind of things, right, so they dressed a certain way. That's because they thought everything was on the outside. And so then we just swung the pendulum the other way and said, hey, I can look like the world and just not act like it, but we found out we were really, you know, When God's been trying to change the heart, change the mind, right? Redemption, redeeming. So in this particular case here, something was about to, there was about to be an exchange, wasn't there? Uh, because look, the kinsman, because the word redemption literally just means um, redeemer, right? So the redeemer, the near kinsman redeemer, was about to make an exchange, wasn't he? And because he already declared, yeah, I want it, but then he declared, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want it. Right? And so when he makes that decision, then following the law, right? Because they were under the law then, right? Following the guidelines, the rules, the requirements. Then, you know, he was giving up his right to what would, would be rightfully his. Okay? He was giving up his right, wasn't he? So he was about to exchange. So he had to make, you know, he, he had to bring... Um, he was about to give the evidence or the proof of the exchange, right? Which was what? The shoe. Now, I'll just say this. I'm way ahead of myself, but in the simplest point of view here, you have to understand this. It goes like this, right? Like, if that's our custom to give up the shoe, right? So Steve says, no, I don't want it. So Steve gives me his shoe, right? Now I own the shoe which becomes proof that I own the land and Ruth. Do you get that? Does it make sense? Now, Steve could later on tell, tell everybody, he stole it from me, right? But there's an issue here. He'd never be able to do that because there are what? Witnesses. This is why he has all the other witnesses, right? Are you with me? The reason you have witnesses, right? Is, listen, listen. The principle lies here for witnesses, right? You have to have the principles. Because, like, I'm at the end of the verse. This was a testimony or a witness in Israel, right? It reveals the principle of a witness, which shows that there is power 
demonstrated with God and man. Look, when there's witnesses, it gets carried out. There's no reneging on the deal. Wait, you, you gave up your right. Okay. Gave up your right. Now, we haven't answered the question yet. Why a shoe, right? But it's pretty cool because you, we have to understand something. Okay, are, are you good so far? So the word changing, something has to change. Everybody say this with me. We have to change. We can't just change to the place where we want. I like the Kathy Walker song. Aren't you glad he doesn't leave us where we're at? He keeps changing us. Right? I mean, God doesn't leave us. Like, we can go through a lot. You know, we're, we're going to live in this life, right? We're, we're living in this life. You're in the world, but he tells you not to what? Be of the world. And expect that you're going to have some pressure along the way. But in the midst of pressure, he wants to exchange an old life for a new life. Because he redeemed us from the grave. All right? And look, the deep end of the pool, the far... The far point of the lake, right, is, is here. You ready? It's incorruption and immortality. But there's going to have to watch. This is what Paul wrote. Didn't he write this? Let me show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, die, right? But we shall be changed. Now, the reason you and I may or may not struggle over that, it just depends on our depth of what we want to believe, right? But here's the reality of it. You do not see that, the reality of Adam's way. You don't see that every day in life, do you? Matter of fact, you don't see it at all, do you? It doesn't change the word. We can't fall into the trap. Look, even if God opens the windows of heaven tomorrow, it can't happen. And the reason we would think that way is because we think that we, watch, we only think about the process of how things are today. Watch. And God still works in the process of what? Plant a seed. Doesn't he? Plant a seed. Grow a plant. Produce some fruit. He works in that, doesn't he? He created that, didn't he? But don't think for one moment that he can't. Look, there's no rain. We'll dig some ditches. Oh, wait, oh, where did it come from? The sons of God. Are you all right? Okay. So change, 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 change. All right. So um, redeeming, concerning, right? Uh, uh, Concerning, redeeming, concerning, change. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews. Chapter 7, where do I want to start? Now, this, this is a chapter about change, right? And this, this verse we're reading, right, concerning redemption, shows that things have to change, okay? Here we go. Let's, let's just read, sorry, with verse 11. If therefore perfection, is that not what we're talking about? Completion. Anybody in here? Perfect. God's perfect, right? Oh, he sees me that way. Yeah, he does. He sees us as a finished work. But here's the part that nobody's ever told you. He also sees you where you're not there yet. <laughs> so don't run around thinking, well, he only, he, see, he only sees me perfect. No, if he did, he wouldn't work on you. He sees the whole story. I love my children. I see them as adults. I see them growing up. But wait, I still have to. Are you with me? This is how crazy we've gotten over the years. Because you know why? We wanted the easy lifestyle. And really the truth of the matter is we still gauge our Christianity and God's approval of our lives, how blessed we are with natural things. There's no doubt about it. 
God loves me, so he gives me all those things. He loves you, and he does give you all those things. But don't ever think for one minute it's brought you to perfection or brought me to perfection. Or watch this, or will. Something has to change. Because watch, seriously, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be harsh. If you don't think so, go look in the mirror. I certainly have a lot more gray hair than I used to. And no matter how hard I try, I cannot stop. I can hide it, though. (laughs) But I can't stop it, can I? This is why God's trying to get you and I, watch, to perfection. So look, Adam's way, no matter what, will never perfect. This is what, look, Adam tries this already. He talks about love. Adam talks about kindness and all these things, all the attributes of God. And there's nothing wrong with that. But look, unless it comes from God, they're just counterfeits. Here we go. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, right? What further need there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Okay, so they had a priesthood. It was called Aaron. Matter of fact, under that priesthood, right, you couldn't even be a priest unless you were a Levite, could you? And and we don't go to Nehemiah, go to the book of Ezra. You can find out, look, when they found out, when they started reading it, there were a lot of folks, right? I, I think this is interesting. There were a lot of folks that were priests, Just because people named them priests, because they were friends and family. They got the friends and family discount. But watch this, they could never trace their genealogy. Do you hear what he's really saying to us when he went through that whole thing? How do we trace our genealogy to Christ? You have to be born again. You have to have a rebirth. And once you are born again, you become a new creation. It's just the start of a journey that brings you to maturity or perfection. I'm a new creation. Hallelujah. Now start acting that way no matter what your age is. If you're just a believer just at the beginning or even near the end. Okay, so there has to be a change. Okay? Okay, here we go. Verse 12, this is where I wanted to get. For the priesthood being changed. Are you with me? So this verse in chapter uh, 4, verse 7, is dealing with redemption and change, right? Look, you had to be a priest under Aaron, but now God changed something. Aren't you glad? Look, no possible way could you run around, I'm a king and a priest, because you, are you with me? But the truth of the matter, it still exists. You can't run around yelling you're a king and a priest. Right? Because you'll end up like Simba. You'll be out in some, no worries, no care, kuma madara, whatever it is, right? And you'll be eating the wrong stuff, messages from other people, bugs and worms, and when you should have been down eating what a lion eats. There's a lot of church folks eating critters. Because they're hanging out with smelly warthogs. Telling you to take it easy. There are no worries out here. Are you with me? He is changing things. All right? For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity, a change also of the law. Something had to change, right? Because you had to be from the Levites or the Levitical priesthood in order. Where did Jesus come from? What tribe? Judah. And then we all know this, right? Why did he come out of the tribe of Judah? Because what God really was after is someone who would prevail or overcome. And this is why all the way back to the book of Genesis, long before the law showed up. This is what I like, Steve. 
long before the law showed up, the word was already prophesied to Judah that kings shall come out of you. Before the law. Don't eat bugs and critters. Don't let people fool you. God's purpose has never changed from the beginning. What is his purpose, Pastor? His purpose is to have a people with the spirit of his son, fully mature or fully developed, fully grown up, perfection, completion. Are you with me? So there had to come a change, right? There had to come a change. Had to come a change. Okay. All right. Are you good with that? So we're, we're, we're reading this verse because a change is coming, right? And there's, there's a change, a change. Everybody say this. I love change. Not all change, though. But that doesn't mean it isn't good for us. Amen. Come on, God, God will take you through areas of your life that, man, you wouldn't go. Are you all right? But he knows better than, you know, I, I, Father knows best. He really does know, right? Lord, I'd never take that path. You're right, you wouldn't. But I led you there because I know this is what it will take for you to change. I've totally, I, I, like, I was, I was eating lunch on Friday with uh, one of my coworkers, you know. I don't know, I told the story before, right, about my friend Bobby from Taiwan, right, and everything. And I always kind of felt that he was a Christian at some point. Well, he guess what? When he was in Taiwan, he grew up as a Christian in a Christian family. But he's kind of fallen away. He said because Christians are really just hypocrites. They say they're one thing and they really do everything different, right? Now, I told him, and you know me, I'm an analogy kind of guy. I said, you have real money, you have counterfeit money and real money, right? And if someone gave you a counterfeit bill, and you found out that doesn't mean you'd stop using real money. All right? So just because there's counterfeit Christians or even counterfeit attitudes in some Christians, right, you don't stop following Christ or become all that he wants because of that, right? But we have to come to a realization that there has to be a change in our lives. to fulfill his word. And it can't be just legislated. Look, I don't mind legislation. Train a child in the way they should go. And I like to say this, train a God child in the way they should go. Because there's a lot of children that have gone the other way. Train a God child in the way they should go. And when they were old, right, this is what it really means. They won't need a law to tell them what to do. It'll just become life. Am I doing the right thing? It's still the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, here we go. Are you all right? Change, right? A changing of the priesthood, right? Changing of Aaron's priesthood is an impart realm, isn't it? But the Melchizedek priesthood is a what? Fullness realm. Okay, now, I like this. It's a fullness, isn't it? Okay, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the what chapter? What's 1 Corinthians 13? No, it's not the love chapter. That's what everybody's told you because you went to a wedding. I'm just teasing Steve. It's really, it's a what? It's the perfection chapter. It really is. I know it talks about love, and it ends with love, but I want to show you something, even like how people will say this. Because, because it's, okay, so here we go. Watch. First, chapter 8, uh, chapter 8, chapter 13, verse 8. First word, charity or love, right? Wait, see, I told you. <laughs> no, no, let's wait. Let's calm down here. Hallelujah. Hey, watch. The Bible says God is love, right? But you know something? It's love out of a father. Are you with me? Not love out of a mother. It's a love out of a father. How do you know that? Our father, which are in heaven. And that's no disrespect to mothers, is it? 
No, it's just God's order, isn't it? You know what I like? Watch. Watch. We need to move from a mother in part mentality to a father fullness mentality. It's the full order. It's the change. And if anyone thinks it's disrespect to mothers, it's not because God has already determined the place. It takes two to become one. What's he really talking about? Christ and the church. Watch, and I'll say this, right? Anytime you think I'm just talking gender, watch. Hey, hello, hello, we're all the mother, aren't we? Church. Bride. What do you want to call it? But what he really wants to do is produce sons. Bring many sons to what? Glory or the thinking mind of God, which really just means growing up. And you know, our thinking can get stimulated by what God wants, but he really wants us to demonstrate this. Okay, here we go. I got sidetracked. Charity never fails, right? Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. I I like this. All the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end. That should be an awakening for Christianity. All the special gifts and powers from God someday will come to an end. But love goes on forever. Someday, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, these gifts will disappear. I'm going to go back and forth, okay? King James. For we know in part. Everybody say that. We know in part. And we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. But when we have been made perfect, I like that. I'm reading out of the Living Bible, okay? But when we have been made perfect and complete, for these inadequate special gifts will come to an end and they will disappear. What will you need to speak in tongues for? Why will you have to prophesy? Why will you need to heal the sick? Why will you need to do all these kind of things? And I just want to clarify, I'm not diminishing or minimizing any of that. We are dealing with change. Change. I'm not, watch, you know one of our big problems as church folks is we pursue that instead of pursue the purpose and allow that to become naturally flowing out of us. Just saying. Right? Wouldn't you really rather pursue a purpose that brings about wonderful byproducts? But when we have been made perfect and complete, then the need for these inadequate special gifts will come to an end and they disappear. Verse 11, when I was a child... I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Okay, here we go. It is like this. I like that. Colon. It is like this. Are you with me? When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child does. Right? Everybody knows this. When we're younger, we reason differently when we're older. And usually because we don't have as much experience and we can only think from our position of what we know, right? And so Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, right? I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Like, wait, where's Selah? What are you thinking about right now, baby? You know, you get my point? Like, uh, I don't want to go to school tomorrow. See, she shook her head, yes. (laughs) Are you with me? But you know when you get older, right? 
Wait, I can't pick on Kaylee because she still thinks that way. I don't want to go to school tomorrow. <laughs> Are you with me? Well, but like when you get older, you come to the realization, wait, if I, go, if I don't go to school, I, I won't be very smart or I won't learn what I need to learn, right? And when you become a teacher, you can't wait to get to school, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and all the teachers are throwing daggers at me. Okay, here we go. But watch this. When I was a child, right? When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned like a child does. But when I became a man or a grown-up, right, my thoughts grew far beyond those of my childhood, and now I have put away childish things. Watch. I I just have to use this analogy. Like, I'm sure, hey, Titus, where's Titus? Titus, you want a girlfriend? Nope, see, But when you get about 16 years old, your thoughts might change, won't they? Look, I'm a 60-year-old man now, and like, right, like, I don't even care about stuff that much. I like nice things still. But you know what? The pursuit of chasing God gets stronger as you get older. This is why you don't put elders as young folks. <laughs> Are you with me? Here we go. But when I became a grown-up or a man, my thoughts grew far beyond those of my childhood, and now I have put away childish things. Everybody say this with me while we're still reading it. Change. This is all about change, isn't it? Change. We have to change the way we think, don't we? Has nothing to do with my age, does it? Okay, here we go. Verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as, I, as also I am known. I like that. In the same way, we can see and understand only a little about God now, as if we are peering at his reflection in a poor mirror. But someday, We are going to see him in his completeness, face to face. Now all that I know is hazy and blurred, but then I will see everything clearly, just as God, just as clearly as God sees into my heart right now. In other words, he's talking about a oneness here, isn't it? All right. I like this. Now I know only a part, but at that time I will I will know fully as God has known me. God And and we have to understand something about the word knowing, to know him, watch, to know him. It's like in the Greek, epe genosko, it means to know him by relationship, built epe, upon, the word epe, it's a compound word. Epe means upon, to know means relationship. Watch, I want everything immediately, line upon line. Precept upon precept. Pretty cool. Here a little, there a little. When I was a kid, I used to think the preachers were making that up about here a little, there a little. But no, that's actually what the prophet said. And you know what here a little, there a little means? Everyday life. God's changing us. Watch, remember this. Who are you, Ruth? Ruth. What happened to you? And watch, that wasn't even the fullness. It was just on the path, wasn't it? Okay, here we go. Verse 13, watch this. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. There are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now, we see that word greatest, and so what we do? Oh, I'm not going to chase after faith and hope. I'm only going to chase after love because it's the great thing. That's the one. No, what he's really trying to tell us, it's a threefold cord. And the word great literally means, like, what? You ready for this? It's, It's like the cherry on top, right? It's the thing that binds it all together. Watch this. It really shows us what it is. It's the completion of threefold things. 
So without all three, are you with me? It doesn't work. So if you just pursue love, well, if I just pursue love, I'll have it all. No, 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 no. These three things. Watch. I don't need Passover to be born again. I don't need Pentecost to be filled with the Spirit. I only need tabernacles. No, you need all I, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right? Watch this. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead. So I hope you understand this chapter is about change, which really is a chapter about perfection or completion. Watch this. We only know in part. But that which is in part when it becomes perfect or complete. The love of God or, the, or love completes it. We see the, the, we see the English word greatest, and so what do we think? Oh, it's the biggest and the best. Right? But that, was not, that, that is not what he's saying there. What he's trying to get you and I to understand. It completes, can I say it like this? The trifecta. Amen? Everybody say, we've been talking about change, growing up, maturing. So, there's concerning redemption, redeemer, and concerning changing. Something has to change. This is the illustration, or this is the understanding in the illustration that something's about to change. Can I say it like this? We move, even though grace always existed, right? Come on. Before there ever was a law, Noah exhibited grace. He had God's grace, did he not? But what happened was, when mankind falls into their trap of Adam, right? And everybody knows what the law is about, right? It's just trying to control And the reason people need to be kept in control is because people are, Adam is out of control. But God doesn't want to do it with an external law. God wants to do it with an internal law. I will put my laws in your inward parts and write it in your heart. Does everybody have a desire to change, grow up, mature, become complete, become perfect? If you don't, Akuma Matata. Right? Do you know what happened to Simba before he ended up? Do you know why he went and ate bugs and critters and all that? His first little stint was going down in an elephant graveyard. It was still a graveyard. Are you with me? And it was scary down there, wasn't it? That's why we have people preaching the book of Revelation. And it's like, there's Volkswagen. There's bugs as big as Volkswagens. All right, here we go. I'm, I'm done with that. Okay, are you good? I got to quit because we're going to do communion. Hallelujah. So, change. So he plucks off, right? He plucks off his shoe. Uh, the word pluck, pluck off. Um, oh, wait, I, I better say this. It, um, because... Uh, for to confirm all things, right? And then we have to understand if we went to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, right? All things, everything has to be in view of all things. We have to, he did it all, didn't he? This change has to be everything. It can't be, look, a little bit. If we don't break through the veil of flesh, guess what? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It has to be all things, doesn't it? Confirm all things, all right? It means stand up or, I like this. Confirm means to watch, establish. 
What's God trying to establish in the earth? His family that looks like him, acts like him, talks like him, thinks like him. Amen? Could you imagine never needing any law, any parameters? Now, in man's economy, the only way that works is every man does what's right in the sight of his own eyes, right? And that might even be good stuff, right? You do it, but it's still the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, isn't it? You need his word. All right, okay. Plucked off is to pull up, pull out, pull off in his shoe. And I'm going to end here, and I'll give you this to give you something to think about, and then we'll do communion. His shoe, right? The shoe is a symbol of property rights. This is why it's a shoe. And does anybody know why? I don't have time, and you can go read it, but watch this. Remember? Hey, wherever you walk, Abraham, wherever you put your foot, I will what? Give it to you for a what? Possession. And I'm ahead of myself, and I'll go back and we'll look at this, but the minute the kinsman redeemer gave away his shoe, he gave up all of his rights to what he could possess. To Boaz. And the minute Jesus redeemed you and I from the curse of the law, the law gave up all of its rights to kill us. All things, right? And now Jesus has the shoe. And watch, unloosing the shoe and plucking it off and giving it away. Are you with me? Unloosing the shoe is a sign that the deal has been made. The transaction, watch this, is completed. (laughs) I don't know if you look. And the minute, see, he owns, everybody say this with me, Jesus owns the shoe. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Okay, see, we get excited if we say, oh, the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. It's the same thing. He owns the shoe. And watch this. There's witnesses. And it can't go back. And no matter, watch, if the accuser, everybody listen to me, the accuser accuses you of anything, he has the shoe. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. All right. But just, just you, you know that's, you know that, right? Uh, it's, it's, the shoe symbolizes the property rights. Look at, if you own it, you possess it, you can walk on it, right? It's your land. You can walk on it anytime. Anytime, right? Any way you want. It's your privilege. You own the shoe. You own the land. You can walk on it. He told Joshua the same thing. Wherever you put your foot, it's yours. Didn't he say that? It's all about owning the shoe. It's all about the possession of the land. And not not just the land, but watch, even the treasures in it. Ruth was a treasure, right? Amen. All right, well, let's stand. I I could, I I want to, I'll go into this a little more. Um, So it, it just, look, if you own the shoe, if you have the shoe, right, that means you have all claims and rights to the land. And whatever is on it, whatever is tied to it. And I'm way ahead of myself, but hallelujah, if Jesus owns the shoe and we're joint heirs with Christ, watch. That says I can watch this, walk this out. I know we're using a physical little natural thing about land, but what he's really trying to, the whole shoe, the whole point of walking, possessing is all about this, being able to walk out 
beyond an in part realm into fullness. Change. We can walk this out because he has redeemed us. It may not happen overnight, but it might. Are you with me? It might. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Hallelujah.